Well, it's a very warm welcome this uh, Tuesday evening uh, to Insight Live. And with me is Kurt. Uh, you're welcome to say hello. Well, it's great to be with you. And as usual, usual we, have a to we have topics that are very challenging. And tonight we're asking the question, is kindness killing the church? Which is a very interesting one, is, because is, we have to add that to our faith. But at the same time, why would kindness be killing the church? I think it's a very interesting topic. And uh, if I was just to guess off the top of my head, I'd say, you know, are we actually dealing with the difficult questions that are arising? Are we actually approaching uh, church and being the body of Christ and following Jesus in, in the way that he taught his disciples? You know, you've got the Sermon on the Mount, you've got various other what incredible uh, parables that we actually have to unravel and say, well, are we really living according to those teachings and are we keeping each other accountable and many other things? So I think I'm sure there's going to be a lot of that uh, in our conversation. But tonight we have a, a, a special guest and he has been on before, Hugh uh, Osgood. And uh, many of you know him, and he's been an incredible uh, contribution to Revelation TV over the years. And uh, incredibly, uh, I would say, versed in so many things to do with the scriptures, to do with uh, the church, and to do with God's ways. And so we're going to be uh, very excited to introduce uh, you to him a little later. But meanwhile, Kurt and I want to kind of just have a little bit of a banter. Yeah, but you have banter. to pray that I'm not going to faint this time because maybe there's some viewers <laughs> out there. And do you remember last time we were interviewing uh, Hugh, Hugh Osgood? at the old studios. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I overheated. I, you know, I had a lot of wrinkles on my shirt, so I put a jersey over to hide the wrinkles in my shirt because I wanted to be presentable for you guys. And what happened is I simply overheated and I fainted on live television. And I think it was Five Song Dave wrote a comedy about me. Yeah, yeah. And somehow I'm immortalized in that. But let's take something, okay? I, I just said that phrase, is kindness killing the church, which happens to be the name of Hugh Osgood's book as well. But let me read just a few verses from Acts chapter 15, starting in verse 1. And maybe we can kind of fit this in, is kindness killing the church? And it said, certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. Now, imagine if they said, ah, oh, you don't have to go up to Jerusalem. You know what? If you feel that and that's your reality, then, you know, just go up and go out of, you know, you can leave the denomination and start your own church. You know, it, it, what's important is what you feel. But it wasn't. They were fighting for truth. They were standing up for it. And I don't know if you've ever been to Israel and you've argued with people. I've, I've talked to rabbis. I've talked to everybody in Israel of, of all different persuasions. And one thing about my experience is you were in Jerusalem as well. Mm -hmm. They pound you, man. Nobody's polite there. Nobody's kind. I mean, you know, if, if you want to win an argument in Jerusalem, God be with you. It's, it's really hard. They grill you. They question you. And, you know, in America and England, a lot of times we're very kind, quote unquote. We're very polite. We have this polite optimism. Whereas here, it brought them into sharp dispute. And then after a fight, after some good pounding, praise God, it seemed good to them in the Holy Spirit. Not physical. And then they made some laws <laughs> for the Gentiles. That were very loose, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, but we are called to peace. We are called yeah. to peace, but that doesn't mean that we compromise. We're not going to compromise. Yeah. So anyway, I want to play a video of uh, Hugh Osgood. It's um, is kindness killing the church. Before you introduce that, ready. I just need to okay. remind our viewers that we were uh, we are live and interactive. <laughs> if you thought we weren't, we are. And on your screens right now is our email live at revelationtv.com. You can write in with your opinions. Keep it nice and short. Keep it nice and sweet. On this uh, topic is kindness killing the church. And our, our dear, um, uh, our dear uh, guest is going to be on pretty soon. And you can also write in via SMS. The number is on your screen. So let's go to this, uh, to the video. this right video. Away. 
Is kindness killing the church? It might be the kind of question that we just want to brush off with a simple no. But I want us all to stay with it for a moment. Why ask that question to begin with? Back in the first century, the church that Jesus began was gloriously diverse. It was held together by a commitment to each other and to the truth that ensured its unity was robust and well able to handle intense debate. Despite their differences and persuasions, they lived out the unity that Jesus had prayed for. Today, the church is just as diverse. We're blessed with a rich variety of expressions and traditions that God has raised up over the centuries. But we miss out on the true unity that Jesus spoke of when we gloss over our differences or hold them to ourselves. Once our churches start preferring polite, kindly acknowledgements when robust debate is required, we're robbing ourselves of the reality of our God-given unity. The aim of this book is to put unity on every local church's agenda and to strengthen every church's confidence in its God-given calling so that we can bless the world around us with a church that shows how unity truly works. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. That was a good introduction. And yes, we are going to be inviting Hugh Osgood himself to come on live uh, via Skype with us. And we are looking forward to your interactions with him as well. So, uh, Hugh, what a great privilege. Thank you so much for taking time to be with us here on Insight Live tonight, uh, live on Revelation TV. <laughs> And uh, what a pleasure to have you for the second time. And I'm, I'm glad we're not having any disasters in the studio this time, praise God. <laughs> so let me just give you this opportunity to say hi and uh, to, to our viewers right now. I mean, I love being on Revelation TV. I do Church Without Walls. I do other things with you, lots of our mornings over the years and other things. But it's great to be with the two of you. And as you say, I definitely remember the last time we were together. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, I think we, we should really start with, because it's not everybody knows you, uh, Hugh. Well, you let, know, we let, do have some new viewers as well. Let me, let me phrase it this way, OK? I mean, you are what everybody would call a senior church leader in the UK with many, many, many years of experience. And I'm being kind, okay. But um, what would you say has uniquely qualified you to write a book on this robust unity that you speak about? What, what have you seen? What gaps have you seen? Why this book? Why now? Why didn't you write this when you were 23? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, well, a lot of the things I did uh, right in the book, I did feel when I was 23, so I haven't changed my mind about a lot of things. Um, but no, the particular reason I'm writing now is I've just spent eight years as one of the presidents of Churches Together in England. And so, you know, I was there alongside the Archbishop of Canterbury, the Cardinal Archbishop of Westminster, the Orthodox Archbishop. And um, I didn't expect to be sort of sitting in such august company. Um, and it was an extraordinary position to be in for the last eight years because we've had to navigate some, some really difficult situations. And one of the things that was concerning me was that I was getting the impression from some quarters that the problem that the church faced was a kind of animosity and tension, perhaps coming too strongly at each other. And yet the more I looked at it, I realized that one of our problems was that we weren't actually engaging strongly enough. <laughs> um, there were things that should have been heard that didn't get heard because everyone was speaking at the same time and expressing their opinions. And uh, I was very conscious that when I was looking in Revelation that Jesus repeatedly said to the churches there, hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. And the emphasis on hearing was something that I wanted to bring back in. And I also wanted to bring back in that sense as if we're speaking, let's speak with clarity and make sure that we're, we're clear on the position that we take. So I wrote this book with, with two objectives, really. One was to get unity back on every local church's agenda. Because when you use that illustration about um, Antioch, you're right that if they hadn't had unity on their agenda, they would have just gone off in the opposite direction. And I notice sometimes when people are expressing strong opinions, they're not actually interested in listening to anybody else. 
So sometimes people would be very argumentative. You mentioned what it was like in Jerusalem. I know what it's like in certain places where people are argumentative. And everybody wants to speak at once and shout each other down. And you never really grapple with issues. So I felt that I needed to do the church a favor as much as I could, which was to try and create an environment in which we are going to listen to each other. We're going to take unity seriously. We're going to see it as a gift that God has given us and build on from that. So that's why I wrote the book. And that's why I did it now. Um, I just finished my second stint as the Free Churches president of Churches Together in England back in uh, April last year. And so I felt I was in a good position in which to put some of these things down. Wow. So if, if you were, let me put it this way, if you were at a local church and the pastor said, um, Hugh, could you just share a couple of principles of how we can just get the language? For example, some, uh, you might be a viewer and you might have complete disunity in your family. And mm -hmm. what are some principles, what are some lessons that you've learned that can help the average person be a peacemaker or a unifier or maybe change the way that they do unity? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And I do want to emphasize that I have written this book at a local church level. And in fact, I've brought it right down to every church member needs to be able to embrace this. So I haven't written it as it were for heads of denominations or something like that. I really want to get down to the grassroots with it. And, and when I look at this question of, of, of how we're going to resolve things and what I'd want to say to a local church leader, whether well, a number, I, I'd want to say, first of all, look, unity really matters. You know, this is important. Uh, it's something that, that Jesus himself is so committed to. When I look at the seven churches in Revelation, to be honest, you know, there are five churches there that I'm not sure I would have wanted to be associated with. <laughs> and yet there's Jesus actually committed to standing in the midst of all seven. And, and, you know, he's the light of the world. He said to the church, you are the light in the world. And yet five of those lights are flickering. And, you know, if he was a politician, he would have gone and stood somewhere else. You know, you want to stand in front of your successes. And yet here's Jesus standing in front of seven lamps, five of which are flickering, and he's there. And he's actually trying to move those churches in a direction that their light shines brightly again. And I really want to see that. I want us to realize that, that yeah, God wants us to be having a bright light that's shining. One of the things I'd also want to say to church leaders, and I'll bring it back to the family in the moment, um, is that, you know, when God raised your church up or your, your denomination up, there was a reason why God brought you forward at that particular time. There was an emphasis that he wanted you to bring to restore to the church. And uh, sometimes we lose sight of that emphasis. So they say that denominations are very often most effective when they begin and then it gradually tails off. And I want to say to every church, you know, what you began with, the passion, the enthusiasm, the energy is what you need to recover. Because that's what God wow. was doing with those seven churches. Well, isn't it amazing? The Church of Ephesus, it talks about you've lost your first love, your Absolutely. first passion somehow. And they were good. They said, look, you have a great doctrine. You don't grow, grow weary, uh, but you've lost that passion, your first Absolutely. love. And if you come back down to the family, you know, one of the things that, that makes a real difference is this, that, that in a family, there's a unity because you're, you're all of the same family. And, and you need to hold on to that. And I think one of the things where the church has got itself in a tangle is that when it talks about the John 17 prayer where Jesus prayed for unity, mm -hmm. there's a lot of conversation about this is the prayer that's never been answered. And I just can't believe that because, you know, Jesus said a few moments before he prayed the prayer that anything you ask will be answered. And here's Jesus praying and the church is saying, well, that one never got answered. I do believe it did get answered. I think our problem is that we're often looking for a unity that's a kind of uniformity or a sentimental mm. attachment that Jesus never actually envisaged. And I think what the first century church moved in was exactly the unity that Jesus prayed for. And I think we've got to come back to that understanding of unity rather than it being a kind of sentimental uniformity. Yeah, but I think unity requires an incredible amount of humility. Um, <laughs> I, I think in the foreword to your book, it was talking about, you know, 
it's, we can learn about each other, but we don't want to learn from one another. And I remember one time in, when I was at Baptist Theological Seminary in, in South Africa, and I've told this story before on television, we were together with um, African National Congress members, uh, right-wing, uh, right-wing. Afrikaners you know, Afrikaners, uh, English, we all had different political persuasions. And then one group, the, the black people were praying for the freedom fighters who the Afrikaners were calling the terrorists. And we were all together in this prayer meeting. And then one guy just humbly invited the Holy Spirit <laughs> into the meeting. And I've never seen unity like that in my entire life. But what happened is there was a level of humility and people were learning from each other. Mm. People who were saying they weren't racist suddenly realized that they were racist. And that was a work of unity that I think only the Holy Spirit could have done. Absolutely. And I think when we say here what the Spirit is saying to the churches, one of the things that the Spirit is saying to the churches is you've got to listen to each other. You've got to hear. But and we don't. I we don't do that. We, we just no, we, we come don't. with our agenda and nobody listens to each other. We just want them to shut up so we can get our opinion out there. <laughs> That's true. And also there's a tendency, isn't there, to, 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 to form our own unity groups with the people that are absolutely like minded with ourselves. So instead of having a unity that's right across the piece, we have sort of half a dozen different unities, depending to which group you belong. And, and I think we've got to value the strength that comes from those groups because it enables us to formulate things clearly. But then we've got to listen to each other and express ourselves strongly and, and go into that kind of robust debate that they had in the New Testament times. Yeah. Well, I was just thinking how um, blessed we are here in Marbella, you know, with the, in San Pedro, with our church, because we have uh, people from all over the world, different nationalities, different language groups. Uh, we have, um, you know, the rich, the poor, the, the whole, you know, all, all of them. Because we're English speaking and there's yes. not many English speaking churches. And they have so, no choice. So the deal is that, you know, you can become best friends with somebody who is a completely different economic level with you, completely different ethnic group or whatever. And you just go, wow, this is amazing. And the richness of learning from each other, understanding somebody else's culture, what they've come through, what sacrifices they've made to follow Jesus, uh, probably sometimes coming out of very uh, you know, traditional backgrounds to actually really embrace the fullness of the spirit and what God is doing in the churches these days. I mean, we just feel so privileged and we have other people visiting from the UK going, well, you know, we're in a small little village and we're all these English people with one particular mindset. So, I mean, how would you suggest to those uh, people, say in a little village or whatever, where everybody has actually grown up, they all know each other, but there's still division. <laughs> what would you say to them? <laughs> Well, you've got to start with the fact that, that God is committed to unity. And we talk about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That is the ultimate unity. God is committed to unity. And he, he actually has said clearly, hasn't he, look, that this is how people know that we're his disciples, because we actually love one another. So the whole emphasis on unity is there in the Bible. If you, if you miss that, you, you must be misreading something. Mm. So this is really important. But actually, coming back to the situation in the UK, yes, we do have villages that are like that. But, but more and more, you know, we're like your situation where you are, where we've got total diversity in our churches. And we've got to work through that. And when you look at the whole multiplicity of churches across the country, I was representing about a third of the congregations in England and Wales. And, you know, they were about as diverse as you could get. So, you know, we've, we've got a huge diversity and, and that's an advantage. We can actually, as we've been saying, learn from one another. And I think God has given us that diversity in the church as part of the unity so that we can build. OK, I, I'm, I'm really curious. Can you tell us um, of a time where there was disunity and there was unity? Something that you worked on, that you were involved oh, in, that is not going to betray any confidences. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that part of my challenge is this, and, and that's why I'm writing the book, that so many of these situations which look as if there's a unity, very often what we've ended up with is a covering up of things that uh, need to be opened okay, up more widely. Okay. And so for me, 
you know, there are situations where I've gone through over the years and I've seen churches work together. And there are times when I feel that they can work together on a particular issue for a season. But if they were going to work together more strongly, there'd be some pretty deep discussions that would need to take place to get to that kind of agreement that's necessary. So a lot of the time I'm seeing work in progress. And uh, one of the things I'd really like to do is to see the church be more honest about work in progress. Um, you know, when I look at Ephesians 4, it talks about to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. And then it goes on and it talks about that we uh, have the benefit of, of the various ministry gifts so that we come to the unity of the faith. And we're no longer tossed about like children and that every joint supplies. And I think that's where we've got to get to, to a kind of place where where we're respecting one another, listening to one another. And we realize that there are things that we've got to resolve. And I think the world will respect us more when we've got that kind of honesty to say, look, there's a work in progress. Yeah. And I think that's how I see yeah. so many things. Well, I'm moment. asking you these questions because, you know, Melanie and I are, are involved with a certain group of churches in the UK. And a few years ago, it split, you know, our kind of group split with the main group because we had a more, if I could say, a more kind of liberal understanding of the place of women in the church. And the other one had a lot of churches in Africa and India, that, in yeah. India that believed a, a, another thing. And everybody says that they're biblical and so on, but they couldn't agree. So they agreed to disagree, I guess, like Paul and Barnabas and went their separate ways. People are still friends. But I remember, you know, sitting there in the UK on numerous occasions, just arguing, arguing with people. And it's not like you, 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 we felt like we couldn't get anywhere. It is a problem. Um, and we've got lots of situations like that at the moment where people are, are arguing. Um, I think that, that it is the case of listening to each other. I think it is the case of people being prepared to actually think about what they're presenting. Because, you know, you can have a discussion about women's ministry in the church and what you really should be having a discussion about is the authority of Scripture. And, you know, very you good. I'm glad you said that. <laughs> and it's very often the need to get down to these kind of deeper issues that, that are stopping us. And we we end up sort of falling out over superficial things when we need to be grappling with some of the bigger issues. Mm. Yeah, because that because that was the main that that was the main thing, the authority yeah. of Scripture. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, Hugh, we're going to just turn to some of our viewers. They've been writing in. Uh, so I think I'm going to read Joy. Joy, thanks for writing in. Uh, lovely that you were with us. You said Acts 13 verse 50, uh, that Paul wiped the dirt off his feet. I feel uh, like that sometimes when people won't listen, and that's from Joy. Uh, what, what, uh, Hugh, uh, how about a comment on Joy's? <laughs> that's really good, Joy. Thanks for writing in with that. Uh, you know, I think when you look at that, what it's saying is this, that one of the things that we do carry on after we've been through a difficult conversation or we felt rejected is that we carry that rejection with us. And I think when Paul and Jesus before him was talking about shaking the dust off your feet, it is about not carrying the resentment, not carrying the bitterness onwards. Mm. But, you know, once the thing's over, just let it go and move on. And I think that's really important. Excellent. But that's a brilliant, holding, that's yeah. a brilliant interpretation. Still holding love for the people. Still holding, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And sometimes, you know, one of the things that we, we could talk about is the fact that, you know, you went through a situation where, where you had a split in a denomination. But, you know, when denominations split, it doesn't mean that the church is split <laughs> because both sectors are still within the context of oh, the church. Oh, we still love each other, yeah. <laughs> and, and that's absolutely important. And sometimes we talk about splits in the church, and yet really what we're looking at is 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 just different expressions that are developing, and we've got to work on these things. Sorry, let's go to the next question. No, <laughs> different expressions no, really that are like developing. That. No, that's actually very like good, that. and I think... I think sometimes what you've just said now is very important for people to to understand that actually sometimes we do misjudge and misunderstand what's happening. Um, you know, yes, I like yeah. I really like that. I like that where you said different expressions. Yeah, absolutely. Flavors. You have another you have another question. I'm just yeah. wondering, uh, let me see who we've got here. Uh, just a greeting from uh, Dylan, who is a regular viewer. Dylan, big kiss to you. Uh, good evening, Melanie and Kurt and Hugh. The video was fantastic. Uh, so um, thank you very much, Dylan, for that. Um, 
And then I think that's the only relevant one right now. We've, we've got yeah. a couple of others that uh, I'm not going to read out. They're yeah, come on, yet. viewers. This is a great topic. <laughs> we need your advice. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Don't. Oh, no, no. We have, <laughs> sometimes people like to write in, and, and it's completely nothing for the, the program. Um, why don't we carry on with some of the, the, um, the questions that we have for Hugh regarding just some of the simplicity, you know, just the ways that we can act in the church when certain things take place. So, did you have something? Yeah, yeah I, I think the Bible talks a lot about how to act towards one another, how to mm. love one another. But, okay, l let me just be honest, okay? When I went back, <laughs> well, I'm always honest. You know, I'm not lying. I'm, you know, viewers know me. I'm, I'm too honest sometimes. But when, I was, when Melanie and I were back in the States recently, I didn't even recognize my nation. I've never seen a nation that is so divided. I'm talking about the church. Whether yeah. you are you were for Trump or Biden, whether you wore a mask, you didn't, whether you believed in a certain conspiracy theory or you didn't. I was reading in Christianity Today that the average pastor in America has lost something like 40% of his friends in the church where they actually despise each other. And it's over these dividing issues. And of course, you know, Scripture says, do everything in your power to preserve, preserve the, the bonds, the unity of peace. But it's just falling apart. What, what advice can you give the church? How, how can we have the tools to, to prevent conspiracy theories and all of these things from tearing division. us apart? Yeah, I've seen it. division. It's yes. ugly. Uh, it's a tricky one, isn't it, really? Um, I am aware of the situation in the States, and I'm aware that one of the challenges is that there's a, a defining of orthodoxy, um, which means that if you believe A, you also have to believe B, C, D, E, F, G, H, and all the, all the other particular things that have been put together on that particular slate. So whereas in the UK at the moment, we've got the benefit of being able to say, well, I agree with you on this, but I don't agree with you on that. Um, that's a luxury that you're losing out on in many parts of the States yeah, now. We don't have that in America. You've got, you, you've you're, got to have that state. If you believe this, then you believe everything else that goes with it. And I think that that's actually in danger of producing a kind of, I don't know, almost like, um, yeah, it, it feels a little bit like we're, we're, we're losing that ability to discern the spirit. It's almost like, you know, it's not what the spirit is saying to the churches, it's what the church is saying to the churches. Yeah. And I think we've just got to be a little bit careful once we get onto these these sort of situations where you've got, you know, all one set of views on this side and all one set of views on the other. You know, mm. I, I think that if we're really moving in the spirit, we'll find there's a more diverse pattern than that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I think socially, I know a friend of mine, she just, she goes to a, a women's Bible study and each, I mean, she's the only one who has her opinion and she just has to keep that to herself because she knows that she just, it would be like rabid dogs. She would be just torn apart. You know, how can you think like that? And I think that's not really a safe place, is it? That's certainly not the unity, uh, you know, that, that we, you know, that deep love that we're supposed to have for each other, even if we do have different political uh, opinions. But, uh, you know, perhaps this is a, a very American thing. I don't know, you know. <laughs> but but, but well, I think, you know, I, mm -hmm. what, what happens in America ends up happening in other places too. So. Isn't that right? Yes, it is so uh, true. Yeah. So so let, let's take a scenario. I mean, let's take that scenario. I mean, it, how would you advise uh, that person? I mean, would you say, well, if you can't have unity um, and you, you, you can't have something in common with them, then maybe find another group? <laughs> what, what, what would you suggest? That's what most people do. You know, ultimately, ultimately, there's got to be a prayer movement in the States that, that rises up and says, look, you know, this is, this is not about set tables of belief. It's about listening to the Spirit of God and, and finding that afresh. And I, I think if that happened, it, it would make a big difference. So I think there's a lot of responsibility on us to pray. And I've got friends in the States I love dearly and I feel for them. And some of them, you know, I know they've got a diversity of view, views, but they're not able to express them because of exactly what you've said. You know, uh, it's not just 
shoot the wolves, but the wolves are there to sort of tear other people apart too. And I, I'm just really concerned. But I mean, it's tricky for me because I'm not in the States. I don't minister a lot in the States. Mm. I listen to my friends in the States and I want to sympathize with them and pray with them. But uh, there are some big issues here. I mean, friends of mine who've read the, my book in the States, there's one or two people I sent it to, actually were very kind and said, look, this is, this is something that would really help us. Because what I do in the book is to address seven different types of church with different emphases. And I think that actually to go back to recognizing that you actually probably got that degree of diversity if it was allowed to express itself, then I think that would be really helpful. Yeah, I, I find that very inspiring, the fact that there are seven types of churches. Mm, mm. I, I would find it very, I mean, we talk about the unity of the early church and so on, but still you had seven very distinctive churches with, with very, <laughs> you know, Laodicea, that was a very wealthy area, et cetera. They had their own problems. It was, you know, then you had Philadelphia, Current. love, a different one. So, you see how, yeah. so I, I was very encouraged by the diversity of the churches in, you know, in, the, in the first century. Yeah, the, and if you look at Ephesians 4, it, it actually says that which every joint supplies. So there's a sense in which every church is going to be contributing something slightly different into the whole, which is why we need the unity, because we need that kind of diversity in order to get to where we need to in terms of our but, understanding but, 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 of truth. Isn't that interesting? I mean, when you read the first church, okay, um, Ephesus, and Jesus starts out complimenting them. You know, you haven't mm. grown weary, you've tested these people. I mean, it sounds like, oh, you've passed the test already. And then he throws that one, oh, you lost your first love. Oh, by the way, you're going to be wiped out and I'm going to remove the lampstand because you lost, by the way, you know. And it, it, it's really interesting because, you know, we always talk about evangelism, John Wesley, we have to evangelize England. And I understand that, but I see more emphasis on, you know what, we have to be one, we have to be united. And I think unity, we see it as optional, evangelism we see as essential. I think both are necessary because if you look at how Jesus prayed in John 17, he prayed that we might be one that the world might know and in a sense, you know, there's a, a, an evangelistic output that comes from unity. It, it's, oh. it's because we love one another that the world gets, gets challenged. And it's so and attractive, that, isn't it? When you yeah. see a football yeah, team united, absolutely. fans that are united, whatever, everybody wants to join. Yeah. But I think the kind of unity that we need is not a kind of sentimental just stitching together if we've got a unity where we are prepared to say, look, we're a work in progress on this, we're still working out what's the best way forward, I think the world will respect us. I think when we're trying to sort of make out that, yeah, yeah, no, we're, we're, we're sticking everything together and we're fulfilling this prayer that Jesus prayed, we can miss a lot of that robustness and strength which we could be presenting. Well, one of our uh, viewers, Eddie, who writes in always with a, a sharp kind of uh, a bit of a knife here, Christian unity, question mark. And just on the same subject that you, we were talking about, Thai Curtin, Melanie, Mahatma Gandhi, um, uh, once said he thought about converting to Christianity because he liked Jesus, but he couldn't because he didn't like Christians. And that's, that's what Eddie South from Africa, Birmingham. <laughs> yeah, thank you for writing in, Eddie. And, yeah, this is this is the thing, the very thing that, you know, you will know that we are Christians, you know, they will know that you're Christians by, uh, you know, our love. So it's exactly what you said, Hugh. And, uh, you know, for, for Eddie, you know, Eddie always comes in with a, a good question and has a bit of a barb <laughs> on it, you know. So no, but it's a good, good question. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I'd love to have had a chat with Mahatma Gandhi on that particular topic, because <laughs> to be honest, before, before I gave my heart to the Lord, I had real problems with Christians. <laughs> I did. I think, you know, I'm attracted to the Lord, but, you know, I don't know that I want to be like that. But, but John was absolutely right in his first letter when he says, by this we know we pass from death to life in that we love our brothers. And there's something about giving your life to the Lord that brings a new level of loving into your own life, which we're not going to get unity in the church without. So, you know, Peter was absolutely honest when Jesus said to him, do you love me? 
uh, and he had to say, well, Lord, I like you, because at that particular point, before the Holy Spirit had come at Pentecost, he couldn't confess that the love of God had been shed abroad in his heart. So, you know, part of the whole unity thing is knowing that we've got that unconditional love of God in our lives. And that's when we really do start loving one another in ways that we should. Well, I think attached to that comment that you just made is actually that we're, make, we're putting more emphasis and more importance on something that is like an eternal thing and, and not just what's comfortable for us and what we're used to and what our culture dictates. So I think that does require, you know, that extra spiritual um, <laughs> discernment, really, and, 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 and I suppose sacrifice in a way. You know? Yeah. yeah saying no to self and yes to God, isn't it, really? Yeah. 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 No, we're but not going to get you if we're all parading our egos. Yeah. <laughs> no, let me just go to no, this. That, that Can I go to this email? Of, of, of Eddie, very interesting, because I remember he wrote that when he was in South Africa. Yes. So, yes, there was unity in the Afrikaans church. Yes. There was unity in the Sutu church and the Zulu church and the, <laughs> and the Northern Sutu church, yeah. in, the, in, in the English church, but nobody was together. Not as Christians and together. And so Gandhi saw that, and um, he had every right in the world to, to say what he said. Well, our next uh, viewer, Hugh, says, very interesting topic. I think, and then it says, niceness in inverted commas can be an issue, perhaps especially among women. Uh, there can seem to be a pressure on people to appear nice and kind, and you, can, uh, and you can let your guard down in a way, and you would not, uh, you would not do outside of the church and get hurt as a result. So obviously our, our viewers, uh, you know, just become very trusting and let their guard down and uh, backfired. Uh, any comments on that, Hugh? It's it actually, it's not only a woman problem, is it? <laughs> no, no, no. Lots, and lots of people have got hurt in church because they've trusted and then the trust has been abused. And I think we've got to face that. And this is one of the reasons why I think, you know, we need to get unity on the agenda because it does come down, as we were saying at the beginning, to personal relationships as well as, as church relationships. And we, we, need, we need to see a better way of doing things. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, Cynthia talks about, uh, hi, Cynthia, lovely that you could be with us here on Insight Live. Uh, you've talked about that your church is 36 members, including children. Uh, yes, a small congregation, but we all work as one body in unity. I just feel these big mega churches, it's impossible for the pastor to know everyone. And that's my personal view. Blessings to you all. Uh, yeah, absolutely. It's difficult. And there's a different structure and everything. But I, I think the problem in big churches and small churches, whether it's, um, you know, if we're talking about unity, it, it can attack. <laughs> Disunity can be in both of them. It just requires even in a smaller congregation for somebody to be, you know, gossiping about somebody or saying an untruth and the next thing you've got all this other, other stuff going on. Um, yeah, so uh, Hugh, what about the differences in unity and the way that the pastor has to manage, say, a mega church or a smaller congregation? What have you found um, in your research and your experience? Yeah, well, I've, I've sort of experienced both. and I, I work with both kinds of churches a lot. Um, I, I go back to the New Testament, and, and in, in writing this book, one of the things I was thinking very much was that if we can get back to that first century template, it would help a lot. And one of the things that you see in the first century was that when they were all together in Solomon's porch, they were dealing with about 5,000 or more in the church, and the apostles were dealing with that together, and they were together for that kind of teaching, and yet also they were breaking bread from house to house. So you can have a huge church, but you can still have a relational church because it relates on a smaller level in smaller groups. And, you know, you can have a church which is small, and but, you know, as you said, the, the problems can come in anywhere. And that importance about maintaining unity and maintaining love is something that we really have to build, whether we've got a mega church or a small church. So I, I don't think it makes a huge amount of difference. But I do think that if you are leading a mega church, you cannot do it with this kind of mindset that, you know, I'm the man of God and I sit sort of so many feet above contradiction and you can't get to me. You know, there needs to be relationship and it needs to be demonstrated from the top down. Mm, mm, absolutely. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, if you if you have a wrong model and you have like the man at the top, you, you're definitely not going to have 
a healthy, uh, a healthy church because, you know, when we saw how Jesus, uh, you know, sent out his disciples, trusted them with the power of God. I mean, it doesn't matter what size the church is. We need to realize we are the living stones. We are the mm -hmm. ones that Jesus has called to, 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 you know, to be unified and to go out and to preach the word. If we're leaving it just up to our leaders or to the main, uh, le le you know, church leader, we, and we're just sitting back and listening and getting fat on all the, the wonderful words word of God, I think that's, and we're not being practical and, and actually applying it. I think we've got a very, very sick wrong model in that. But, but I, I think the template is, I mean, I don't know if the early church is the gold standard of, of unity. I mean, I could say, well, they <laughs> devoted themselves not. to the apostles' teaching, but then Peter went rogue and he started teaching a, a whole nother gospel and then Peter has to rebuke, I mean, Paul has to rebuke him and get him back on the track. So. <laughs> Maybe John taught better than Peter. I don't know. I wasn't around then. But what I do like is in that Jerusalem council when the Gentiles were coming to the church and, and certain men from James you know, spied on the freedom that the churches in Galatia had and so on. And I, I liked how they got together in these councils and just treated it so seriously. I, I, I don't know if we, if we do that today. Yeah, that's exactly my point. I think, you know, when I say I think that that's a model, I think what is the model is that they had unity on their hearts. That's and, you it. Know, even when you've got the falling out between Paul and Barnabas, you know, they got unity on their hearts. And OK, they were practical about it. You know, Barnabas takes Tim, uh, to takes to John Mark off and takes him back to the area of his failure on Cyprus and sorts things out. Paul presses on. But in the end, you can see that John Mark is helpful to to, to Paul, and you can see a, a reconciliation yeah, there. And then you so see, they, they, they honestly had unity on their hearts. Yeah. And also you had the whole dispute with the Greek and the Hebrew speaking widows yeah. and so on. And then they, ch so, so yeah, I don't just, I don't see that. I like that word you used, the robustness. Yeah. I, I don't see that robustness anymore. <laughs> I, I just see people dragging each other towards their agenda. That's yeah. many times political these days, unfortunately. But, but yeah, I, think, I think that's true. But we also have, um, I think, in the English culture, this kind of um, politeness. I don't, I'm going to say no, not a kind politeness, but the convenient politeness because we don't want yeah. to rock the boat. But I think it's really important if we're going to be authentic and we're actually going to deal with these situations. I think it is important. You know, what we're speaking about, uh, you know, what we saw in the New Testament with a, uh, and then and what you've been seeing as well and facilitating, Hugh, uh, these these robust uh, you know d discussions. Debates, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, it's interesting because you know one of the things I do in the book. I, I don't want to give too much away because I want everyone to buy it. <laughs> 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 and it's published on Thursday, and you can get it from any good bookseller. <laughs> oh, good, good. But I, I just wanted to say this really that when I was looking at these questions of is kindness killing the church, I was aware that it crops up in different forms in different churches. So some churches will have a kind of sentimental kindness. Other churches will have the kind of, well, look, we'll stick with our own people kind of situation. And, and you know, we just let everyone else get on with it. And um, part of my challenge when I was, was writing was, was trying to find the right voice. Because I know that uh, when you look at the seven churches in Revelation, they had the benefit of Jesus himself speaking to them. And I thought to myself, well, I'm not going to try and second guess exactly what Jesus would say and, and, and come across with that kind of authority. And I didn't want to say, well, this is what I say and say, well, look, you know, Jesus spoke in the first century. Now I'm speaking. So, so what I did actually was to um, think about those seven churches in Revelation and to think what it would have been like for those churches if they'd implemented the prescription that Jesus gave each one of them. Mm. And they ended up getting through those issues and relating to one another. And I thought, wouldn't it be amazing? Wouldn't it be helpful if the voice that we use to speak to the churches today was like the voices of those church leaders that had been through that transformative experience? Wow. Because, you know, when someone's been through something, and they can share what it's like to go through a correction and get back on track. They can speak very firmly and very deliberately, but also quite graciously. And uh, so I, I did use that. I borrowed their voices a little bit from the first century. <laughs> mm. 
I was just thinking about some of the ways that, uh, you know, we compromise as the church. Um, I don't know, just, just not really calling a spade a spade. And, you know, there are a number of issues that are very, very big right now in the church, which, which uh, we, we're not going to discuss in detail now as we come towards the end of the show, having uh, about, about nine minutes left. Um, just wondering, you know, um, you know, especially on a, on, a, on a leadership level when there's a congregation pushing for something or leadership pushing for something and the congregation not wanting that or whatever, and vice versa. Hugh, what would, what would you, you know, what would your comments, I mean, I'm sure you've had these, these discussions and you've had to actually maybe even do intervention or whatever, where there are these desperately d different opinions. Yeah. I mean, that's exactly why I wrote the book. Um, I feel that this is where we're at at the moment. We're coming down to issues which are dividing congregations, separating congregations in a local level, one group of congregations separating from another group of congregations. We're in a very fragile time at the moment. And I think that what we've got to do is we, we really have got to get back to this point where unity matters because, you know, the temptation just to sort of, you know, walk away from one another and, and not address the real issues is, is, is great. And, and what, if we can create a climate where people can begin to be open and start talking about issues and, and actually to be listening to one another so that, you know, it's not a case of as soon as I express my opinion, you express yours and then we agree to differ. Mm. But, you know, I express my opinion. You probe me on that. You ask me questions about that. You take an interest in what I'm saying. And I do the same for you. Then then that's where we actually make progress. And if we really are meant to be going forward to the unity of the faith, because that word until we all come to the unity of the faith in Ephesians 4 is really important. We're living in the until. We're living at this point where we we are seeking to make progress on issues. But, but, and, and but, but we need to do that. Let's, yeah. let's slow down here. Who is creating these climates? I mean, most churches I see shut down arguments. They don't allow you to wrestle with God. There's no wrestling mats in the churches. They're, yeah. they're all out of the, the, you know, the church. You know, there's just one way. If you don't go my way, you go to the church down the road. So who is creating these forums where people can wrestle and grapple without being judged heavy-handedly? Yeah, well, it's beginning to happen. Um, you know, in some ways, I know people are holding up their hands in horror and saying, oh, look, the Anglican church has got all of these big discussions going on. They don't know where they're going on this and they don't know where they're going on that. At least they're talking to each other. Now, I don't believe they're necessarily talking about all the issues that need to be talked about. And I do think that when a church just talks within itself without taking everyone else's views on board, you're not looking at the whole picture. But we are beginning to get some of these discussions opening up. And, you know, there's a lot of people in the church who then want to shut the discussions down. You know, let's settle this as soon as possible, because the world must find it really difficult that we're having these discussions. Do you know, I don't think the world really does find it difficult that we're having these discussions. I think that, you know, if you've got a church that's here to proclaim the truth, then we've got to work on what the truth is. And I think we get respected for that. I think society is a pressure that the church needs to work out how to relate to. I think the church um, has become a little bit like, you know, marketing consultancies. We want to know what the focus groups think before we make our decision. <laughs> and uh, to use the world as our focus group is not a great way. <laughs> that is a very bad test. Yeah, a very bad test. Just going to read some uh, some emails quickly, Hugh. This is from Joshua Jama in, uh, in Manchester. He knows you. Hello, Hugh. Nice to see you after such a long time. How do you handle a situation where someone in a local church feels he is gifted and wants to be given room to minister regularly? As senior pastor, if you feel otherwise, and he gets offended that he is not being given room enough. And that's from Joshua Jama oh, wow. in Manchester. What I've about that? that? A lot of times. <laughs> oh, well, gosh, it's great. I mean, I didn't know you'd escape to Manchester. I think last time I saw you, you were in London. But uh, yeah, great to catch up. And uh, yeah, I think what we've got to do is when we're dealing with, and we've all had to deal with this. And, and what it is, is you've got someone there who, who, who needs to mature. 
And in some ways, we've got to help them understand that, that restraining them is actually part of maturing them. Mm. And I know that's a difficult exercise, but if we can put our restraints in a positive way as possible, it, it does work better than if you're always confrontational. Mm. So sometimes if you're talking to people that have got ministry aspirations and they're running too fast and they always want the platform, you just need to sit down and say to them, look, you know, if you want your ministry to be effective, uh, there's a verse in Proverbs, isn't there, which says, you know, if if the rewards gain too quickly, it's lost quickly too. And so, you know, going steadily at some of these things is good. So I wish you well with that one, Joshua. Yeah. Good. Just uh, before we finish, we are just quickly, Jim in Ireland says, hi, everybody. Thanks for your program. I remember seeing you in London when I was attending the uh, Kensington Temple back in the early 1990s. It's good to hear uh, him, a level-headed man at this time. Thank you for him. Hope to see him uh, often on Revelation TV. God bless Jim in Ireland. Thanks, Jim, for that. Well, uh, right now we're coming to the end of the program, so we do want to kind of advertise your book a little more and to say <laughs> where you can get it. And you did mention earlier that to Amazon, uh, you know, Eden, any of the outlets where you can buy yeah, books... I I think once it's out on Thursday, which is only, what, two days ago, <laughs> yep. um, you could go to any Christian bookshop, you could look on Amazon, and you should be able to find it. It's called It's Kindness Killing the Church. And there you go. It's by me. It's up on the screen. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, is there any dialogue happening? Are, are there any websites where dialogue of this kind can happen? Is there something in the book that relates to that? I haven't done anything on that yet, but it's something that's very much in my mind, and I'm looking forward to to to, to facilitating some of these roundtables. Uh, it's something that I'm passionate about, and I think if we're going to see the church going in the right direction, we need more of those. So, yeah, I have to watch this space and see what comes up. Good, excellent. Well, well before the program, I was asking about what he's going to be doing in five years. You know, I just threw that <laughs> number out, but I would love to see you hosting a roundtable and getting these kind of yeah. discussions going. I would love to see. I think you'd be so good at it, but that's just my, I'm not the Holy Spirit, I'm just Kurt. <laughs> okay, so Hugh, we have to say thank you so much. We want to remind our viewers that you can pick that book up on Thursday. It's going to be released on Thursday, so don't go to your bookshops uh, tomorrow. <laughs> go on you Thursday. <laughs> yeah, you can do a pre-order. <laughs> All right. And it's on Kindle as well. Yeah. Thank you, Hugh. We want to just give Hugh, you a thank huge you so thank, much. A huge thank you for being with us on Insight Live. It's just been delightful just to hear the calmness in your voice around these difficult subjects where the Lord wants us to bring unity. And uh, there he commands the blessing. So thank you so much for being with us. And uh, thank you on behalf of our viewers as well. Thank you it's so been much, a joy, Hugh. Melody. Okay, joy until joy. next time. God bless you. God Bye. bless you. Well, for those Bye. of you still with us, uh, what, what a great uh, conversation this was. You can get his book, uh, Hugh Osgood's book, uh, you know, How Kindness is Killing the Church. Uh, it's going to be on a very, very uh, normal level. It won't be a, uh, too high. Buy it for your church leader. Buy it for your pastor. Get it in your home and have a a look as to how you and I can actually make a difference in bringing unity to the church. That's what's so high on God's uh, agenda, Kurt. Yeah. I remember we had one guy in our church, uh, uh, Bill McCurran, who was, became a federal judge, and he was kind of my preaching companion in San Diego. And he had this unique ability to go in where there was no unity, and he would be that peacemaker. And I've always been like trying to get there but I'm not quite there yet. So I just want to pray for every one of us who is battling with maybe disunity in a family or at yes. work. And Lord Jesus, I just pray the spirit of unity. I pray that we might be one, our families, Lord. Mm -hmm. I just pray, Lord, husband and wife who are arguing or at each other all the time, mm -hmm. brother and sister, we just pray for your peace, for your unity mm -hmm. and everybody who's watching this right now. In Jesus' name, mm -hmm. amen. And we do pray for the rest of the, the churches, the, the battles that we have in the church, that we would be able to implement what we've spoken about tonight. So you do your part, I'll do my part, Kurt will do his part, and we pray that the Holy Spirit would guide us in all these things, bringing unity and peace to the church so that the world may know that we belong to him and that they would be jealous and want to know more and come to Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for your emails. It's been a wonderful program with Hugh Osgood. Get his book Thursday. It will be out yeah. in the local bookshop stores and on Amazon. Good. And we'll see you next week. Great being with you. Bye, God bless. Bye-bye.